Hear me now? Good evening. I'm Tina Olson. I'm the director here at the University of Michigan's Museum of Art. Welcome. Uh, as I said upstairs, it still feels unnatural to do all of these in-person things. So I was going to say, please come forward and all sit together at the front, but I recognize that maybe people don't want to do that. If you do want to do it, please come forward. Um, Tonight's program kicks off a two-day convening that will shape the planning for the upcoming exhibition, Hear Me Now, The Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina. I want to thank Dr. Tanya Matthew, CEO of the International African American Museum, for joining us as the keynote speaker tonight. Her talk will begin in just a moment, followed by a brief Q&A. So Hear Me Now, The Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina, is an exhibition focused on the work of African-American potters in 19th century American South and the contemporary artists who have responded to that history and legacy. The exhibition will open at the Met in September 22, which we just realized upstairs is in six months, move to the NFA Boston in March 23, and then land back here um, at the University of Michigan Museum of Art, UMA, for fall 23 semester, before going on to the High Museum in Atlanta. Starting tonight and for most of tomorrow, we will be talking about issues that inform the display and collecting of works originally owned, uh, originally produced by enslaved artists and artisans. So what questions does that raise? Um, among just a few, how do we, as museum professionals, ethically and morally display the work of enslaved artists? What are the ethics of displaying work uh, from Edgefield um, in what has become uh, a lucrative market context? Leading us in this important work are the three co-curators of the exhibition. Adrian Spinozzi, Assistant Curator of American Decorative Arts uh, in the American Wing at the Met um, in New York City. Ethan Lasser, John Moore's Cabot Chair of the Art of the Americas at the MFA Boston. And Jason Young, Associate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. I also want to acknowledge the broader curatorial team that will shepherd this exhibition as it travels. So that includes um, here at UMA, Laura De Becker, Interim Chief Curator and Helmut and Candace Stern Curator for African Art. And at the High Museum in Atlanta, Monica Obniski, Curator of Decorative Arts and Design, and Katie Gentleson, Marion Dan Boone, Curator of Folk and Self-Taught Art. And I would like to thank the University of Michigan Institute for the Humanities for their support of this convening. So it is now my great pleasure to bring to the stage Jason Young, who will introduce Dr. Matthews. Jason Young is Associate Pro Professor of History at the University of Michigan. He thought I wasn't going to do this. He's the author of Rituals of Resistance, African Atlantic Religion and in Congo and the Low Country Region of Georgia and South Carolina in the Era of Slavery. Young has published articles in the Journal of African American History, the Journal of Africana Religions, and the Journal of Southern Religion, among others. He's currently conducting research toward his next book project, To Make the Slave Anew, Art History and the Politics of Authenticity. Jason Young. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, <clears throat> and thank you all for coming out, both from from near and from far, uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you um, Dr. Ta Tanya Matthews, whose achievements are both inspirational and more than just a little bit humbling. Um, I can only hope to touch the surface of her truly remarkable career, and I'm very much looking forward to her remarks today. Dr. Matthews holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from Johns Hopkins University and a Bachelor of Science in Engineering in Biomedical and Electrical Engineering, as well as a Certificate in African and African American Studies from Duke University. Dr. Matthews is the Chief Executive Officer of the International African American Museum, I am located in Charleston, South Carolina, at the historically sacred site of Gadsden's Wharf. Uh, for, for those who, who don't know, historians estimate that approximately half of all of the enslaved Africans who were brought to North America disembarked at Gadsden's Wharf, and so the location of the museum 
at that, at that site makes her work both historically relevant, but also deeply significant spiritually. Uh, although Dr. Matthews is a native of Washington, DC, she has deep, deep connections to this region. Uh, most recently, she served as associate provost for inclusive workforce development and director of uh, STEM Innovation Learning of the STEM Innovation Learning Center for Wayne State University, and prior to that, as president and CEO of the Michigan Science Center. In that capacity, Dr. Matthews founded the STEMista Project as a way of engaging girls interested in STEM careers. She continues in that work today through STEMista Rising, which supports professional women in STEM, with an inclusive emphasis on women of color. Dr. Matthews has been recognized as one of the most influential women in Charleston. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences Board of Science Education and was appointed by both Democratic and Republican administrations to the National Assessment Governing Board. In addition, Dr. Matthews is a published poet. And I have to say at this point, I just feel like you're rubbing it in a little bit. <laughs> like, you know, it's a touch. <laughs> Her work has been included in a, um, the poetry collection, 100 Best African American Poems, edited by Nikki Giovanni. She has written in the fields of inclusive governance, nonprofit management, and fundraising. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tanya Matthews. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, it, it, uh, it, works, it works both ways. Uh, it's very humbling also to have your bio read and like, ooh, they're about to expect a lot, um, aren't they? So I want to thank you all uh, for, for coming out um, to, um, to kick off this conversation. Um, at the end of the day, um, my job is just to present questions. Your job is to present uh, answers over, over the next couple, couple of days. Uh, and so, you know, I'm gonna go a little left of, of center and right and back and forth, perhaps rephrase some conversations we've already been having. Um, but I do um, like to leave folks with a few tools and tips at the end because as the man said, I am an engineer. Uh, so if we can go ahead and bring up uh, my uh, presentation. Um, and while they're doing that, um, sort of one of the things that I would say, you know, it's interesting. I have been in uh, the museum space. Essentially, this is this is my space. This is my home. Uh, this is my career uh, in this place. But you may wonder, what's an engineer doing running a history museum? Uh, professional and personal. On the professional side, uh, I like to shortcut the story and essentially say uh, the two scariest words in the English language are racism and algebra. <laughs> and you'd be surprised at uh, the similarities uh, in trying to bring people into conversation in both. They both start with, well, well, that's not about me. That's not for me. Well, I never learned that. I can't really do that. Oh my God, my kids got to study this. What do I do now? So a lot of those are very, very much the same. So there is a bit of that skill set of bringing folks into conversations that they feel unprepared for, that they may have been told that they were not supposed to be in. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and then there is, of course, the, the personal side. Um, particularly when it comes to the International African American uh, Museum, you know, I would say it's an incredible, um, it's incredible honor, yes, but it's an incredible responsibility uh, to think about the impact uh, that this museum could have uh, and what it means uh, for myself and the folks who are in my space. So listen in, uh, bigger ideas. Uh, and co-curation, an equitable engagement of cultural heritage through art, of uh, three sections uh, that we'll sort of go through. First is context is queen. I think whenever we're talking about these, these kinds of conversations, cultural heritage, um, context makes a big difference. Critical wisdoms along the way. Uh, things I've learned, things I've found out, mistakes I already made. No need for you to make them as well. Uh, and then next level tools. One of the things that has struck me is that the conversation about cultural heritage, particularly say for example, sensitive cultural heritage such as items made, curated, crafted by enslaved Americans 
or um, that were part of Native American um, consecration and burial ceremonies, these conversations have gone to the next level, right? There, there's a different level of conversation that's happening. There's a different level of agency in the conversation that's happening. But the tools that we use to engage in those conversations, they haven't leveled up. Uh, with the way that our community is leveling up and wanting us to engage in those conversations. So I have some thoughts around that. So first, uh, let's talk about uh, context. And one of the things that I want to say was one of the questions I was asked uh, in particular is the challenge of a PWI, a predominantly white institution, stepping into this space. But I actually want to make clear that the key word in PWI is actually institution. Uh, and I think that that is one of the things uh, that even I am learning to, to take into account, because it is the construct of institution. Um, if you are big enough to call yourself an institution, um, part of your foundation is around exclusivity, is around who is invited uh, and who is and who is not. And so there is still um, sensitivity in this conversation. Now, people may come with different assumptions, depending on which side of the seat you sit in. Some may think it's easier or harder to be at a first voice institution. But the challenge is essentially our own cultural construct. Pro tip number one, never give an engineer a time lapse video. She loves it. It will show up in everything. Uh, and so this is the International African American Museum uh, being built now under, under construction. Uh, and I use us as our own context. Um, as stated in the introduction, we are indeed being built upon the site of Gadsden's uh, Wharf, one of our nation's most prolific slave trading port, right? Which means, of course, it's the site of, of trauma. And it is uh, this, this site of you know, one of, of the institutions that we are still recovering from. But at the same time, it is a site of pilgrimage, a site that people will uh, come back to. And thinking about how to build on that site, which usually you get a park or a memorial, the choice to build a museum in that space comes with an interesting level of uniqueness uh, and, uh, and responsibility as we think through uh, that space. So for example, one of the things that you'll notice is that the building actually sits above the ground. That is not actually a flood feature. Uh, that is an architectural design feature. When our architect, Mr. Uh, Henry Cobb, uh, learned about the story behind the space upon which he was building, he decided that it was indeed hollowed ground. And for the first time, he was designing in a space where the building was less important than the ground itself. And because of that, he chose to make the design decision to actually raise us up off of the ground. That was part of his tribute. The space that surrounds our museum, uh, our landscape architect, is Walter Hood. So Walter is helping us work through what I call um, the complexity of African Americans' ability to simultaneously hold the instances of trauma and joy. Not trauma on Tuesday and joy on Thursday. It's just all wrapped up there in the same time. And to be authentic about curating the site and the space and the objects and stories inside, we've got to also embrace that as well. Not necessarily leaning into one side or another. So in terms of today's conversation, in which I'm going to be using terms like storytelling, art, artifact, for me, they're all in that space of cultural heritage as we talk through it. So the context of a couple of our key challenges, just two spaces inside the museum. One, the Center for Family History. OK, so why is a museum building a genealogy center inside of the museum? Not the ability to do genealogy. It takes up a full 10 to 15% of our footprint uh, on the field side. It is a walk-in servicing genealogy library. Research assistants, genealogists there to help folks um, dig into their history, dig into their ancestry. So why? This is part of the lean into uh, the stories that we're covering and the African American journey in particular. So there's going to be a lot of excitement um, because prior to not just modern tools of genealogy, but also um, modern philosophies about genealogy. There's more energy around um, helping African Americans trace their history beyond um, slavery, 
right? So before it was, it was known there are some issues there. There's the wall of 1870 where, um, you know, the U.S. Census was not recording folks by name, uh, black folks by name prior to that. There is the way that families are constantly separated in the period of slavery. There's the fact that folks were kidnapped and taken with no respect to their name and all of these other things that make uh, genealogy in this space, quote unquote, impossible. But with modern tools and modern philosophies, that is not the way we're thinking about it. And so this has people very excited. You know, I, I'm trying to share some amazing artifacts we, we've managed to get, the, the space, um, the view, and they want to know about the Center for Family History, right? So folks are very, very excited and very, very engaged in being able to reach back uh, into their history. So what unintended havoc might this wreak? Well, we're having this conversation right now because we're talking about curation around um, materials created by formerly enslaved uh, folks whose descendants are discovering who they are and want agency and part in that conversation. It's one thing to find that, uh, that you are related to this particular spot, this particular home, this particular place. Let us not pretend that the conversation becomes even more interesting when you find out you are related to this $280,000 pot that just sold at auction, right? It opens up a whole new conversation. And the truth of the matter is that if the museum is successful with our genealogy center, these conversations will actually happen more often, not less often, as folks discover who they are. And that has as much implications for the field as it does for our own galleries that include these kinds of materials. The second is the Gullah Geechee Gallery, our soon to be as pride and joy. And I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but I also want to help some of our, our listeners who may also be sort of watching this in recording. So the Gullah Geechee people are a particular African-American community uh, in the Southeast who has had this amazing tradition of preservation of, of culture, of preservation and creation of, of new culture. A lot of that came out of the inhospitability and the particular nature of slavery in, say, for example, the Low Country uh, near uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, between the alligators, the snakes, uh, and the state bird, more commonly referred to as a mosquito, um, what you would find is that the big house, so to speak, tended to be farther away um, from some of the plantations. And this lack of proximity may have made it slightly less threatening as the enslaved peoples began to create um, their own ways of communicating, create their own ways of culture. And of course, you remember that one of the, the, um, the major um, foundational points of, of maintaining the institution of slavery was to be sure you were mixing and matching peoples, people who didn't have the same language, didn't have the same tradition. If they could be warring tribes and communities, even better. We throw them all together so there's no way they can or would ever want to communicate, form a unit, and rise up and attempt to be free. Happy to report, greatest failed social experiment ever. Uh, and so what actually did happen is part of what came out of that is indeed uh, the Gullah Geechee um, heritage, right? So down to the traditions and clothes and language and food. And so this is um, a really important part of, of the space and the history and the tradition. Uh, and the Low Country in particular is one of the epicenters uh, of the Gullah uh, community that ranges from uh, southern North Carolina up to northern uh, Florida. You have the full Gullah Geechee uh, corridor. So this is amazing and this is wonderful and no one will be able to tell the story quite like we can. But there are some challenges here. So we authentically will have a living history gallery. We like to talk about that, right, in, in the history space. We like to say our, our museum is alive. History is about the present, which all of that is very, very true. Um, but this is actually very literal. And so some of the challenges that come here, think about the way we have socialized our visitors to understand cultures when we're talking about them in galleries. We're usually talking about cultures that were blown up by a volcano or destroyed in an earthquake over centuries and centuries ago. So one of the challenges that we run into is creating the false illusion um, that this community is a far gone community. Then we also end up in the space of culture versus caricature. 
right? So the challenge with, with stereotypes is that, that kernel of truth uh, that's in there. So when we talk about um, the lilt of tongue that actually comes with, say, the Gullah people because there's actually another language that they speak in their homes and on their regular basis. When we talk about shrimp and grits, absolutely, by the way, if you didn't know, that's where that comes from. But still, there is so much more to, to that culture. And we're talking about the colorfulness of the clothing and the speaking. And so this is one of the things we need to be very careful about as we are bridging and helping to explain um, and introduce this culture. One of our current partnerships is with our um, the Charleston County uh, Public Library System. And we added a Gullah storytelling line uh, to their dial a storyline. And this was some of the internal conversations that we were also having to help people understand um, that this this is not actually broken English. This is a specific way of talking. Trite is in the eye of the beholder, right? And so when we think about these things of well, we're going to um, open up the gallery or we want to have a celebration, um, that white clapboard praise house that we're so used to seeing depicted um, in the South is a, is a heavy and healthy part of the Gullah tradition. That's essentially where that's coming out of the Sea Islands. So if you're thinking through, we want to celebrate this, we want to honor this, we've actually taken footage um, from a worship service um, in an active praise house uh, over on one of the Sea Islands, and to put that in that space, if you're not careful about creating the proper space and the proper energy, what you end up with is, oh yes, you know, we're gonna do this and we're gonna sing Negro spirituals, right? And it can become a very extractive kind of conversation. So trying to create the right space, the right energy, the right ownership, the right agency in a gallery in which the people are literally uh, sort of still here. Right, uh, one of our um, hard hat tours included um, some uh, educators and teachers from um, our regional and local school systems. And one of the things she talked about was, yes, that was part of her misconception. She thought she was just studying history and understanding the history of the culture till she walked into her fourth grade classroom and couldn't understand what her students were saying because this was indeed their community. And they would flip back and forth uh, between English and between Gullah. So so trying to help folks understand um, that this is actually a living, growing, evolving uh, community that is as prominent in our political system as it is in our cultural heritage uh, is something that we are cognizant of. So those are sort of two of the things that we're looking at in context. So when we're talking about equitable engagement, um, critical wisdoms. So again, I one of the things I'm really enjoying is actually being on my own learning journey as I step into um, a new space, new climate, new culture, um, new museum architecture. Um, and so one of the advantages of being in this space is that there are days when I think like a visitor. Right? Uh, and that actually comes quite uh, in handy, and that comes to the community as well. So what you're looking at on the, on the screen is, is something that I was well warned uh, and, and well schooled on as I came in. Within the community, um, there are two types of people, Kamya and Binya. Anybody from here, South Carolina? Y'all already know what I'm talking about. So Binya as in we've been here. Kamya as in you just come. Right? Okay. So that, that, is, that is what it is, easily identifiable. And this is a key phrase, come ya, can't tell been ya. Right? So as we think about this, this is probably a really good philosophy for us as curators, us as cultural heritage professionals, us as museum activators to actually think through, right? It's part of what we have been trying to say in, in uh, statement after statement, policy after uh, policy, case study after case study. Here it is, four words, come ya, can't tell, been ya. Right? And so taking that philosophy and understanding that the burden of finding shared language to unearth community wisdom is actually on us. Right? If we are coming into a space and want to curate, want to lift, want to showcase, um, and we know that we're coming on two different sort of languages, actually the burden of figuring out common language and common discourse is actually on us. Uh, in terms of coming into uh, that, that space. And so this has actually become sort of a really good guiding principle as, as I think about this. 
Second thing, uh, listening is a full contact sport. Full, full contact, full contact sport, because equity is hard, hard. That's why we, we waited several years before we added the word. You know, we had diversity like back in the 80s. We gave ourselves some time, right, to build up to understanding equity is hard because equity comes with the presumption of prior inequity. And I think it's something we always have to sort of remember um, as we're thinking about quote unquote leveling the playing field or inviting folks to engage in converse, in equitable conversation with us means we are directly and deliberately addressing the implications of previous inequities that make that um, conversation difficult. So on the listening as a full contact sport, okay, we all know active listening, we throw that phrase around you know, it's being focused and present and in the conversation. And so I would say that that is foundational, what we already know. But the second thing that I would say is it's an interesting art form, listening while talking, otherwise known as read the room. Okay, we read the room. Even as we are talking and explaining and communicating, there is something um, very, very powerful about also trying to watch the way the conversation is being received uh, in real time and being sensitive to that and knowing how to pull back and to pull forward and to have that conversation. When I say full contact sport, I like to talk about body conscious listening. Uh, and I'm actually talking about the speaker, right? And it's, it's the way we lean in and the way we lean back. So leaning in may suggest urgency. It may suggest focus that we're there. Leaning back may actually be a pulling into conversation. Whoa, I'm getting something. If you let me make some space for that, what, what, like what, what, what am I seeing uh, sort of in these, in these things? And these are actually things that we do very well in situations in which we are familiar. If you're, say, having a conversation with a best friend or a family member, you are very, very used to using your full body in the conversation, right? I mean, a shoulder tap, a hip bump, depending on what's happening uh, in the conversation. You're always using your full body. For very good uh, and practical reasons, we do not necessarily think about using our full body in conversations with strangers, with, dare I say, others, in spaces that we are unfamiliar. But it is still something that we can do to help think about the energy that we're bringing into the room. So we talk a lot about listening. And so these are some ways that I've broken it down because many of us have walked into a room and you said, I was listening. And they didn't believe that I was listening. I don't understand. I did all the active listening things and it just didn't go well. So I've been still thinking about the way we can do that. And then, you know, talking about the room. So we've done a lot of, of work around talking about the room, right? So we all, whenever we want to have our community meetings, we all know to meet in a circle, right? Yes, OK, we meet in a circle. Sometimes we even move away the desk, and it's just a circle of chairs. This is really, really good. This is good and intentional. But understand that the room has physical and figurative. So we need to think about the room physically and figuratively. One, you can make the circle all you want, but you have to be conscious that there are certain people that are in the room wherever they sit is the head of the table. You can make it a circle. But the seat of power is often still very clear. This is not about doing something necessarily about that seat of power. It's about acknowledging it in our planning and the way that we approach it, right? Everything from separating the various seats of the power so that the circle doesn't lean to, to the left or, or, or to the right sort of moving things around. Um, but part of it is really sort of acknowledging. But that's the easy stuff, right? The, the physical stuff is the real easy stuff. The figurative aspects um, are what's more difficult. Honoring the different levels of preparation that are coming into the room, right? And this is on both sides. So this also goes into the onus of finding a shared and common language, right? Very similar to, you know, high, high, easy, easy level. You know, we say, oh, you know, we know that our field has acronyms. You know, space have acronyms. You'll see people thinking through that. But we need to understand that every community, and we are a community, museum folks, cultural practitioners, we are a community. Every community has language and norms. And we bring that into the room with us. We have the ability and the obligation to serve as our own translator, 
that we're doing in that space. So, okay, we're, we're bringing things. We're bringing studying. We're bringing pre-work. We're bringing the fact that we thought about the room. We're bringing the fact that we know everyone who's going to be in the room. So this is really, really good, right? And we know that the folks on the other side of the circle may not be bringing that. So that's one understanding the different levels of preparation into the room, which may mean if you're that much more quote unquote prepared, you may want to move faster, right? You may feel like conversations are moving too slowly. You may feel like, well, we haven't gotten to the point yet. You may feel like, why did introductions take 37 minutes? There are only 13 people in the room. I asked for 90 seconds. Okay, so part of this, if you're more prepared, you feel like moving. But we also have to remember to flip it, which means that the people you have invited to the room, you have invited them to the reason, for a reason, and it tends to be because they have some level of preparation that you do not have, and we could not look up. It may actually mean that they know the community, right? that they understand these things. It can also be as deep as they actually have the family and the oral histories that we're actually trying to get to and through. And unless we identify the same language, and the reason we identify the language is because we acknowledge the preparation, we may miss something, right, in terms of receiving that. So the second is honoring different relationships to the room. Some folks are going to be very comfortable in the room. Some folks are not going to be very comfortable in the room. Some folks have been in that room and had a very positive experience. Some folks, the room is now triggering, okay, because of sort of what's, what's happened. And this is not necessarily anything that we will know in particular. The safest thing that we can do is assume that everyone has a different relationship to the room than you do. And your job is to be self-aware and group aware enough to know and understand this, particularly when we're talking about bringing community in um, to, to have conversations with us uh, around that. So let's talk about that shield, uh, the bronze, uh, the pots. So we, we have lots of things, right, that we can talk about. And so I'm very excited about the conversation that is kicking off here. I'm very excited about the conversations uh, that this traveling exhibition will kick off um, because, in particular, the conversation is not singular, right? This is part of the institution. This is part of the culture. What is singular is the approach that we're taking in terms of thinking about how we're going to move forward with this, how we're going to move sort of consciously and broadly and differently in ways that actually does indeed have implications. So as I mentioned, when it's starting to come to conversations around um, artifacts, crafts, creations, of enslaved people that are that are coming to light um, or that have always been in the light and we're now simply uh, acknowledging who the actual artisan was, what that actual uh, life is like. What I find really interesting and why I want these conversations to be translatable is that we should be much more prepared for these conversations than we are because many of us have been working in earnest um, and in, in the best authentic sense that we can with First Nations, Native American peoples for quite some time. But we didn't build a bridge, right? We, we haven't really thought through translating those things. Even as we're having current conversations about returning the Benin bronzes, that conversation is not actually connected with African American cultural heritage, right? So we're not, we're still working um, in these separate bins. And I think that one of the most interesting things that we could do in this conversation as we go back to arguably ground zero, um, is thinking about how this uh, translates uh, in, in different ways. And some of the things that I like to do is perhaps sort of make jarring, somewhat jarring uh, juxtapositions. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right now in an agreement and jarring, slightly jarring uh, juxtaposition and get us to think about this particular sentence. So centering David Drake as the enslaved artisan who wrote his name on his pot is on par with centering Van Gogh as the artist who cut off his ear. Accurate, but dehumanizing. And the reason I use that is because I made a broad um, assumption that this community in particular would have that classic visceral response 
when someone refers to Van Gogh as, isn't that the guy who cut off his ear? Right, which, okay, yes, but, right? You, you, you immediately sort of jump into, into the yes, but. And I had the opportunity to, uh, to see the immersive uh, Van Gogh exhibition when it was here in, uh, in Detroit, and then it was also in DC, been touring in the country. And it was very interesting to me how, you know, you went through 15, 20 minutes, if you were actually taking your time, through learning about him. Right, the stories, the studies, the struggles, the loves, the hates, the fights, the arguments, even in his own words, right? We had correspondence, we had letters, all of this before they would let you get near the art, right? It was part, part of that context. And yes, we did talk about, um, you know, about, about um, you know, the cutting off of the ear, but then that really dovetailed into, we probably understand that today is being bipolar or being manic or something. And so now we had a full contextualization of this person. We even sort of had, had a name to that. We do not, typically even attempt to do this um, with um, artisans who are from quote unquote marginalized uh, communities. But let's say that this group in particular, this exhibition in particular, is focused and determined to do that. Once we focus and are determined and are committed to do that, then we can actually confront the head on um, realism of the fact that it is really hard slash nearly impossible to contextualize uh, an, an enslaved individual um, in the way that we can contextualize Van Gogh. And so then the question is, given that, what do we do with that? Does our lack of ability to contextualize help to manifest some um, dehumanizing assumptions that our audience may be bringing? Is our audience gonna think that that was a curatorial choice that we made, or are we giving our audience enough context to understand what was missing? Is the telling of what was missing powerful in and of itself? Is that part of the way we curate and talk through um, the story, right? Do we talk about you know one name versus all of the other names? And so part of, of what we have the opportunity to do here is the stronger and more deliberately we commit to telling the full story, to quote unquote doing the right thing, the more, um, the more uh, clarity, uh, the more obligation, but also the greater our um, ability to actually confront the reality. Right? If you are not fully engaged with telling the full story, I just want to focus on the pot, just want to focus on the art, you won't be able to follow that sentence with, and besides, there's not enough information out there anyway. Ooh, that's not going to go well, right? But if it's clear that we are committed to actually telling the full story, then our acknowledgement of particular barriers is further legitimized in that. And that's also the way we then begin to have partners. That's also how we actually are able to, to talk to the community and with the community and unearth some of the wisdoms that might actually be there. Last but not least, all right, great. So we've got to let people know that these are not all dead cultures. If I'm talking about Gullah Geechee, I am opening um, Pandora's box, but in a good way. If I let everybody find all their relatives and we start having these conversations all the time, I'm putting the entire burden of colonized art on this one exhibition because we're going to get it right uh, in terms of thinking, thinking through that. So how do we think about approaching and getting into that space. So a couple of things. Um, one, I really like these pictures, um, these two together, because it sort of reminds me of something that even I didn't necessarily know until several years ago. When you discover certain things like the banjo has its roots on the continent of Africa. Now, if you wanted to ask any American, what could be less hip hop uh, than anything, you'd be hard pressed to have someone not say banjo. Right? That, 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 would be, that would be a good go-to. That would be a good go-to. And so as we think about the way of, of stories have been woven, and it's not actually that the banjo has been usurped into American culture. That is phenomenal. That is wonderful to have that foundational piece. It's that it's unclear about how uh, we, we got into uh, that space. So one, 
interrogate the difference between it can be done and who can do it. Right? There are often um, things that we would like to do, projects that we would like to have, um, where we cannot, where we can identify what needs to be done, but then we need to be able to step back and acknowledge we're not necessarily the one to do it. We don't have the right voice, we don't have the right legitimacy. I'll give you a very practical example. Um, many of you are actually familiar um, that um, sweetgrass. Um, artistry and craftsmanship is something that the Low Country, the, the, the Charleston area, the Gullah Geechee people are really known for. Um, these amazing baskets um, and, and things that are created out of sweetgrass. It's, it's kind of something like we're really known for. So some of the curated furniture in our space, which means the more artistically designed furniture, one of the designs uh, that came forward um, was these beautiful rounded um, sweet grass um, benches that we were going to, to have. Great, perfect. We need sweet grass because, hey, we're, we're in Charleston and this is really good. And I'm looking at the things and I'm looking at the quotes and understanding that, you know, because we're an institution, because we're planning for, for high attendance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, what the designer has done um, is to understand that these uh, benches are going to take a lot of wear and tear. So they found, you know, a, a manufacturing company or something such that was capable of doing it. Ooh, that was not from the low country. All right. So, and I said jokingly, but in all seriousness, they will burn us down. Okay. I'm pretty sure they're going to be able to look at the weaving and say, that does not look like my grandmother's hand. So I'm going to need to take a pair of scissors to this bench. Uh, and, and I say that in joking, but I say that in we were looking at a space where we're trying to honor the, the heritage and the culture of the space, but it goes into the do nothing about me without me space. And it was on the museum, though, to understand the repercussions of that. The difference between having one of our griot weavers uh, weave the, the, uh, the sheets uh, to cover the benches and a manufacturing company to cover the sheets of the benches is a bench life of five to seven years. That's literally, that, it's a literal physical difference, right? It has cost associated with doing that, right? At the manufacturing level and manufacturing scale, the lifetime of our benches would be longer. And so it was up to the museum to understand that and make the commitment. We can do a 10-year bench instead of a 15-year bench in order to honor the appropriate cultural heritage. And we're going to take on the responsibility of trying to find a griot weavers at the level um, as high as we can get sort of in, in terms of that. So many ways, understanding that something can be done and who can be do it can be everything from the benches to the curator to how a space is staged to how artifacts are chosen to who's leading the community conversations to who's taking the oral stories. All of these kinds of things uh, play into this space. Two, stepping back to actively engaged, right? And so one of the things we want to become more courageous about um, is decoding some of our language, right? So when we say the word community, right? I, listen, I know it's dark, but I can see you all smiling uh, at the way we use the word community, at the way we use institution, at the way we use um, museum uh, professionals. We need to actually talk about and understand what we're actually saying. Because in this particular space, and today we're talking about African American cultural heritage, particularly that that goes all the way back to and even beyond uh, the period of slavery, we're also working along the lines of descendancy, shared history, and equity. So descendancy is pretty easy to understand, right? Someone direct descendant in the space or conversation that you're talking about. Um, and so I think we're beginning to grapple with that. Also understanding the power and the pull of shared history. When you're talking about so-called marginalized communities, culture is created out of some of that marginalization, right? Culture and connection is, is created. Um, so for example, as our nation is currently watching um, the, um, the hearings um, for um, our next Supreme Court justice, um, there's a different relationship to watching that, right? Obviously, you see her relatives. They're, they're right there. They're in the space, the folks she's been with all her life. But then you have the shared history, not just of the African-American uh, community, but say, for example, African-American women in positions of power through that particular Ivy League pedigree, 
right? There, there's a lot there going in terms of that shared history. And so thinking about how to put um, these various and powerful assets into parity with the institution and the conversation and the cultural heritage professionals is golden right, uh, in terms of, of thinking through that. And it's something that we are going to be sort of dealing with in a very, very big way, um, particularly, say, with genealogy in the Center for Family History. We will still hit walls. We will st still hit barriers. The power of shared history, though, is also one of the ways that we will be able to, to get across that. And so when we're trying to bring together community, when we're trying to figure out who needs to be in the room, we need to understand that there's a full-level continuum of of how people can come into the room and the things that we can actually use. And it is not easy to think about how to put those voices, those opinions, those perspectives um, into parity, but it is so worth it. Second to last is almost my favorite. Whew, I understand our audience. Just tell yourself, it's about, it's not about politics, it's about perspective. At least makes you feel better about the conversation that you're about to have. Uh, but there's actually some truth in this. You know, the, the ancient, ancient definitions of politics really just talk about it's the art of helping people to get along, uh, I think, in terms of that. But understanding that when we're talking about our audience, we are talking about multiple perspectives coming into the space. And again, I lean back into the International African American Museum and what we're thinking. Think about all the perspectives that are going to be coming to our space. For every 20 people that walk through the door, I probably have 37 different perspectives that are coming into that space and just as many reasons and things that they are beginning. So one is the ultimate nature of the beast. Yes, we must choose our audience. We must choose and name our audience. But we cannot confuse that with being welcome to all, right? I think that's the danger that many of us are worried about, that if we choose our audience, we will eliminate everyone else. If we choose our audience, it knocks out our ability to welcome everyone else. No, it's about choosing our audience and understand that then we are welcoming the other audiences into that experience, into that perspective. Everyone says every once in a while, I'd love to be a fly on the wall. It's kind of like that. It's about welcoming folks into that space. It's a particular challenge for us is the International African American Museum. You know, we're in that category of first voice museums. Uh, and I often get the question, okay, great. Is it a mu museum about black history for, for white people or is it a museum about black history for black people? <sighs> I gotta have to fix my face to sort of answer, answer that question. Um, but the question is real and, and the consternation and the confusion about it is real. But what it suggests is taking a particular perspective on any story that we wish to tell um, makes the story less valuable or less interesting to other folks. Um, and that has not actually been my experience. Uh, and for many of us who work in a museum space who've had time to remember their days as a volunteer docent, you remember that is actually not what that experience is. The ability um, to be invited to learn in public um, is one of the rare gifts that any museum space actually offers. And it's not a space that you find as often as we would like to. And so this, I think, is, is really important as we think about, yeah, we need to choose our audience, um, but we also need to understand that we'll have multiple perspectives. But focusing the work that we're doing, the way we tell the story on a singular perspective is not a reason nor is it an excuse to have less welcome for all other audiences. My last leveling up on the toolbox, it is a particular thing that I do, which is that I center the why and not the what uh, in my work. Um, and so as I'm, I'm having conversation with folks, and I'm, particularly when I'm leading them on the tour, or just sort of introducing myself in the space and, and what I do, um, it becomes clear. I am an African-American female who is in charge of building and then opening a museum that sits atop one of our nation's most prolific international slave trading port. Chances are my people actually came through this space. And folks are trying to figure out exactly what face they use to receive that conversation. Nine times out of 10, I am confusing people because I'm smiling, like big smile. 
as I am telling uh, this story and, and communicating this. And part of that is focusing on on the why, not necessarily the what. The what is important, the what is practical. So the understanding and being able to authentically talk about the brutalities and the trauma and the institution of slavery and the vestiges uh, that still um, are being endured um, by African Americans today, African American descendants, I'm sorry, uh, ancestors, and on and on and on. So we're thinking through all of that. But my question that I'm always asking myself is, why in the world would you survive all of that? Why? What was the reason? What is the impetus? Why endure all of that? Perhaps so one day someone like me could actually be running a museum on that space. So these are the things that, that I find um, joy in and grounding. It's very much aligned to working to honor the full extent of the humanity about um, artisans that are coming out of these, these spaces to understand and to dig into the fact that, whoa, there must have been a really big why to get through this. But when you have that philosophy and you're thinking you've got the what as, as your factual basis and then you're using the why in the what can you do, what does this mean, what are the implications, it does help you in very practical terms. So um, the, what you're looking at now is um, a rendering of what the uh, harbor side of our building actually looks like. You're looking at one of what I think is going to be um, the most amazing kind of design features uh, from Walter Hood. It is our tide tribute, our infinity pool. One of the things that Walter wanted us was in constant conversation with, with the ocean. And so what you're looking at is an infinity pool, only about five or six inches of water at its fullest. Uh, it's powered by pumps so that the water rises and falls with the waves to help us be in conversation with, with the water. And if you look into the spaces, you can see ebbs and flows that look a little bit like waves. But if you focus your eyes on, on the, um, the in-depth parts, the lighter parts, you will see that his inspiration were the Brooks diagrams. Uh, and for those who may not be familiar with the language, the Brooks diagrams are the more popular version, uh, more well-known version of the diagrams that show how enslaved peoples were packed into the bottom of slave ships. Right? So this is the Tide Tribute. This is the Infinity Pool. And we were having a conversation um, that essentially, um, funnily enough, uh, was uh, sort of semi-depicted by uh, the rendering that we're looking here. And the question is, okay, we've got this beautiful view and beautiful sight line in this really you know, important and austere space where we're looking at the ebb and flow of the waters. We're looking at the impressions of enslaved people packed into slave ships. The water's going up, the water's going down. We've got to keep people out of the water. Okay, how do we put up do not step into the pool signs? Um, you know, it, it, without ruining, without ruining the view. And then you have the, well, how do we put them up without creating a trip hazard? Okay, so we're, we're going down this, this hole of trying to think about how to protect the pool, how to protect the pool, how to protect the pool. You center the why as opposed to the what. At some point, your CEO pops up and she says, you know what I'm envisioning? This, this, this is actually what I'm envisioning. I'm envisioning um, a little black girl who is walking in the middle of this pond. Her younger brother is gonna come chasing after her. He's got a bit of palm tree stuck in his head. The father is to the left laughing so hard that we think that the tears that he's brushing away are from laughter, but they're not. It's just because he came out of the granite wall exhibit. The mother is then over there yelling, get out of the pool, while she secretly snaps a photo because of the most joyful thing she's ever seen in her life. And what she's thinking is that this is why our ancestors survived so that she could walk through that pool. And so that is the difference. So we're pumping up the filters because we're not going to have a sign. We're not necessarily going to invite folks uh, to walk in that space, but understanding um, the power of, of the joy that can be in the space that is such the site of trauma is essential to understanding that. And this is also why you want to think about perspective. You want to think about who is in the room, because it actually does take someone of a shared history to be able to help those um, who may not have that shared history take ownership of the fact that I can decide that Gadsden's Wharf is as much a place of joy as it is anything else. And with that, that concludes uh, my, uh, my formal remarks. 
So thank you all very, very much uh, for, for your patience and staying there. Uh, I'd like to wish good night uh, to our online um, and uh, watching it the second go around viewers. This has been a wonderful event and I was honored to be here. Thank you. Join me in thanking Dr. Matthews one more time as we pull out some chairs. We have some time to, to take a few questions.